Welcome to JS on Politics. I'm your host, Greg Borowski. Now, over on CNN, that debate, I think, is still going on, but we're ready to talk about it here at the Journal Sentinel. Here's a quick look at our show today. Uh, we'll start with reporter Patrick Marley, who is in California covering the debate. Then we'll dig in on how Scott Walker fared in his exchanges and how he fared on the truth meter Then we'll look at the overall winners and losers and where the field goes from here. And of course, we'll take some viewer questions, so please send them in. But we'll start here with this taped segment that kind of sets the table for our discussion today with Patrick Marley in, in California. We're joined now from California by Patrick Marley, our, one of our Madison Bureau reporters who was covering last night's debate. Patrick, first give us your, uh, first thanks for getting up and, on the time change, but uh, what was your general sense of the governor's performance last night? Well, he had some good moments. You know, he, he took on Trump early on, and that was, uh, I think, probably his, his best moment. The difficulty for him was that with 11 people on the stage, again, a lot of attention on Trump, that he didn't get a lot of face time. He only got three questions. He had to really fight to get uh, on the screen when he could. Yeah, so what, you know, as the governor and his team is waking up and getting oriented again today, how do you think they're feeling about the performance last night? Well, they had a full-on contingent in the in the spin room. The governor was there. Unlike the first debate, he went and talked to reporters right afterward. He said that he thought he did what he aimed to do, uh, and his supporters were saying that he had, you know, shown that he was willing to take on Trump in a gentlemanly fashion. Um, that they took much that from the fact that Trump didn't further attack him after that initial exchange, and uh, they thought that he'd done what he needed to do. The question is, is it enough? His polls have been so bad lately that he really needed a boost from this. And I think there's going to be a lot of questions about, you know, not was this good or bad, but was it was it great? Was it good enough to get him to the, you know, continue on in the right, next Yeah, day? that's my next question. I mean, a lot of times it's this perception battle. So the first time people had probably higher hopes and he didn't meet them, maybe now the expectations were lower and he may have surpassed them. But, you know, he's talking to donors this afternoon. Has he done enough in your mind to you know, keep this thing going, at least to see how it plays out with Trump and Fiorina and some of the others? Well, one thing that the Walker's team really felt that they needed to do this time that they might not have done a good enough job on last time is uh, framing how things went post-debate. They felt like in the initial days after the first debate, it was perceived that he had done just fine. And then only you know, uh, five days or so later did this uh, perception sink in that he had faded into the background. And so I think they're pushing back on that and trying to frame it as they see it as quickly as they can. And that's why the governor was probably out there to, uh, last night talking to reporters as much as he did. He did a lot of media. Um, that's why he's got this donor call with his campaign manager, Rick Wiley, is to reassure everybody and tell them that um, things are going OK. You know, they, they don't believe the polls that are out there nationally. They think that they're doing just fine. But they have to recognize that there's this narrative out there that He's uh, slumped and the public polling has really dropped. And so uh, they need to make sure that that message doesn't affect their fundraising. For right. one, one of the other headlines this week that you were in Las Vegas before you were in California covering the governor's you know, proposals on federal unions, did it surprise you that he didn't find a way to work that into the conversation at all yesterday that, and that it didn't get much you know, national attention when he made such a, a bold uh, pronouncement this week? Right. I mean, it, it definitely surprised his team. Uh, one of his aides told me, when I asked why why didn't it get talked about, they thought they thought he was going to be asked about it, and he, and he wasn't. He did at the end uh, in his closing statement raise some labor issues, but it wasn't center stage, which um, is is interesting. I mean, it's a it's a pretty dramatic proposal, and none of the other candidates are talking about it. I think that's a sign of the trouble that Walker is in is that he's not being perceived as relevant at the moment. All right, and, and lastly, uh, where does the governor go from here? Now he's his on again, off again, on again visit to Michigan is on, but where then? Iowa, what's what's his strategy going forward? In yeah, the coming so days? He, he had these events in California and Michigan. He canceled them both. They were for this weekend, and then he put the Michigan one back on. Uh, obviously, this in ca is in California, so a lot of the California media was asking him, what's, what's this about? Uh, is this showing that the California party isn't uh, important enough? He said that uh, he just couldn't miss this Iowa Faith and Freedom Forum this weekend. Multiple candidates were going to be there that he felt he absolutely needed to be there. So he's in Iowa, Michigan, and South Carolina this weekend. South Carolina, another crucial early state. All right, and you'll be back in Wisconsin soon, no doubt. So thanks for joining us and, and covering the debate last night. Yeah, thanks a lot, Greg. 
All right, we're back live now, and we're joined on set with by Mary Spacuza, one of our political reporters who wrote uh, with Craig Gilbert in Washington, D.C., our story this morning on the debate. Let's just start with general assessments. Mary, what was your general take on how Governor Walker did last night? You know, there was a lot of talk beforehand that this was a make-or-break moment, and he needed to really hit it out of the park. I don't think he did that. Um, I don't think he completely choked. I think he did better than his first debate. I guess the question is really, was it enough? Was it enough to stop his downward pull death spiral? Yeah. Well, Craig, make or break expectations, what were you thinking? And certainly didn't, I think the system was he did better than the first debate, but what was your take? Yeah, I don't, I mean, if, if you set the bar high enough, then, um, you know, there's no way to meet it. And I think um, if he had to hit a grand slam home run, he didn't hit it. He did do better than he did in Cleveland. You know, the interesting thing was in both debates, he suffered from a lack of airtime, but for totally different reasons. It was self-inflicted in the first debate where he wasn't using his allotted time. And in this case, uh, he was kind of ignored by the panel and he did his best to interrupt and get some time, but um, it really wasn't something he could overcome. Yeah, well, why don't we, we start there right away and, and show the breakdown. Uh, this was from NPR's assessment of how much time they had on the air. And you have to scroll all the way down to number 11 to see Scott Walker at the bottom with uh, 8 minutes and 29 seconds. Donald Trump perhaps unexpectedly at the very top with more than twice that. In the first debate, uh, Governor Walker came in second to last and had about 5 minutes 45 seconds. So. Put them together, and you've got less than he'd have time if he was creating a sitcom pilot to, to show to get his message across to voters. Craig, you were t talking uh, before we got on on the air here about uh, the where he was on interjecting, where he was asked a question. How did that break down? Yeah, so there's together? three ways to get airtime in these debates. You can get a, a direct question from the panel. Um, you can respond. You have a right to respond when somebody else brings up your name. Or you can interrupt and just kind of elbow your way onto the stage, which a lot of people did last night. Well, it turns out when you break those um, numbers down, Scott Walker you know, inter got as much time from interrupting as anybody but Carly Fiorina in this debate. But where he suffered was he got as little time as anybody when it came to direct questions. And he also got almost no time when it came to sort of responding. His name was not invoked by other candidates. And that's partly because the panel wasn't asking other candidates about him like they were asking everybody about Donald Trump. So, you know, he, what, was, he, what he was really up against in this debate was kind of a decision on the part of the debate panel that he was no longer um, a frontier candidate, he was no longer central to the story, and that's the way they treated him. We talked about, um, before the show, we were talking about how he kind of was left to the welcome back Cotter approach of the Horshack, like, ooh, 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 because, you know, and trying to jump in because everyone was ignoring him. Yeah, well, the first, that was his first time on, on, the, on the screen, really, other than the introduction, was when he interjected on Donald Trump and said, you know, we don't need an apprentice in the White House. We have one there now. And they went back and forth a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you think, was that his most memorable exchange, do you think? I think it was for me. I, other people have mentioned the, um, you know, I'd love to play cards with this president because he folds on everything. Um, you know, he had a couple of good lines. I think uh, the exchange with Trump was one of the best. They did seem like he'd maybe rehearsed them ahead of time and had them in his pocket and ready to go. Yeah. Craig, did any other uh, exchanges stand out for you with uh, Governor Walker during the debate? No, those are the big ones, but I would say that almost, almost, almost every moment in this debate was better than um, every moment in the Cleveland debate. In the Cleveland debate, uh, not only was he kind of not there, but it really wasn't until the very end of the debate where, I mean, he was dutifully answering questions about issues that, that weren't really defining issues to him, and then it wasn't until the very end of the debate where he kind of got to deliver his message. And so he was very aware in this debate of trying to bring his answers back to his record in Wisconsin, to what he thinks sets him apart from the other candidates, and he did that several times. Yeah, one thing I thought was interesting this morning, his campaign on their website has these five quotes show why Governor Walker won the debate, and three of those quotes, by my count, were from that one exchange with Donald Trump, so he certainly didn't get a lot of airtime. But we talk about expectations and things. Did he do enough? I mean, he wasn't going to win the nomination last night, but did he do enough to s sort of stay in the race and keep the donors happy and the money flowing. I mean, do you have a take on that, Mary? You know, we were talking about, gosh, will he slip off the main debate stage for the third debate? I don't think he necessarily will if they have 10 or 11 people up there. I don't know that he would go before somebody like Huckabee. It is kind of becoming like the Hunger Games of like who's the weakest that's going to be picked mm -hmm. off. 
Um, and I, I think the polls will show us. I, I don't know that Governor Walker is going to see a spike in the polls after this debate. I would be very surprised, but I don't think this was like the end of his campaign. Yeah, Craig, what, do you have a sense of that in terms of, I mean, there's all sorts of levels to the campaigns, and one is, you know, who's funding his campaign and who's funding his super PAC? Are they going to be comfortable with how he did to say, let's, you know, keep some more money flowing to his effort? Well, we'll find out. I mean, it is, um, it's easier to, to linger in these races, even when you're performing badly in the polls and even when the media is ignoring you because of these super PACs. All it takes is a couple of deep pocket, you know, multimillionaires to keep you going. And so, um, you know, we saw that with Newt Gingrich four years ago, where he was able to kind of sustain one big collapse in the polls and rise again for that reason. So I think the bar is lower now on being able to kind of linger and stay in the race and hang around. And then some of this is beyond his control. He has to depend on, you know, the, the voters in these polls cycling through the front runners and they go from one to the other. And nobody is in the driver's seat in this race. That's a good thing now for Scott Walker because he's looking at it from behind, from the rear, and he's got to hope that, that the race continues to be unstructured and unformed and he's got a chance, you know, in the Iowa end game to kind of reset and, and come on at the end. Yeah. Well, we're going to do uh, some more discussion shortly on the overall race, but right now we're going to go to this tape segment of how uh, the governor's you know, statements fared on the truth meter last night. We're joined now by PolitiFact reporter Tom Kircher, who was monitoring the debate last night, and we're going to talk about some of the statements that came up. Now, one thing that's important to note is, you know, is the candidates rely on talking points, so often things we've graded before come up in a new version, and what we've, we're going to go through here are some, some past fact checks that will have some good relevance today. So let's talk about the first one. It's really from the, the Trump versus Walker exchange early on, and this is Donald Trump who says Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker turned a $1 billion surplus into a $2.2 billion budget deficit, and we rated that mostly false. And again, PolitiFact National last night also rated it mostly false on how he stated it yesterday, but talk about that one. Right. What's important on this one is that these are estimates, so there was never actually a state budget surplus nor a state budget deficit. There's an element of truth in what Trump said, in that at one point last year there was an estimate that the state would run a $1 billion surplus. Um, however, again, that was never an actual surplus. What happened was Walker and the legislature, after that surplus was estimated, cut some taxes. Subsequently, tax collections came in lower than expected. So that projection of a surplus turned into a shortfall of about $2 billion. But again, that's a, it's a projection, not an actual red ink, not right. an actual Yeah, I mean, deficit. in the exchange, the, Trump was like, you're in a deficit, right. you have a deficit, the state can't run a deficit by law under the right. budgets and this, you know, the, the Republicans in Governor Walker made some choices about tax cuts which helped cut that deficit. Right. So let's look at uh, the next one. This was a statement from Governor Scott Walker who says, by the end of the budget I'm in right now, taxes will have been cut 4.7 billion in my state and we rated that one true. Yeah, we found that to be a solid figure uh, produced by the State Legislative Fiscal Bureau, a nonpartisan agency. You know, Walker's talked a lot about cutting taxes, uh, income taxes primarily, property taxes, and primarily in his first term. And the, the $4.7 billion is a, is a solid number. Right, and a lot of that comes from, as you said, the taxes from the first term that are right. carried over and continued to be lower at lower rates. Right. All right. We have another one from Scott Walker. Later in the debate, he talked about how many protesters were in Madison. He didn't say it precisely this way, but here's what we had looked at. When Scott Walker says his political opponents brought 100,000 protesters into our state. And when we rated that version, we rated it false last night, though he said it a little bit differently. Yeah, we rated uh, the original statement false because he really went too far in suggesting that 100,000 people had been brought into Wisconsin during the protests in 2011. Last night he was more careful, more neutral in talking about there being 100,000 protesters. The best estimates at that time were that on some days there may have been that many protesters in Madison back in 2011. All right, and there was a, quite a bit of discussion in the debate on Planned Parenthood, and we're going to look at a statement we rated uh, from Hillary Clinton that gets to our point here where she says Scott Walker's defunding of Planned Parenthood left women across the state stranded with nowhere to turn for cancer screenings, breast exams, and birth control. And we rated that one half true. Tell us about how it came mm -hmm. up and then what we can glean from this one. Yeah, that, uh, we rated that half true because it's partially accurate in the sense that uh, Hillary Clinton talked about Walker defunding 
Planned Parenthood, which he did do in 2011, no more state funding for Planned Parenthood. Uh, following that, Planned Parenthood closed several clinics in Wisconsin. But her statement goes too far when she says women were left with nowhere to turn because uh, that money was put into other health agencies and Planned Parenthood uh, made sure that they were referred their people yeah. to other facilities. So women may in some cases gone to new facilities in the same town, but in some cases may have had to travel right. quite a bit the, further. The, the takeaway on this one was the governor talked about he had to fund it Planned Parenthood, which he, he did for the state, state level. That's right. right. Yep. All right, so those are some of the statements we looked at last night. We'll be looking at more statements. If you have any suggestions for us from the debate, you can email us at politifact at journalsentinel.com and check out our website, politifactwisconsin.com, for the latest from, from our, our team and the national team on the Republican debate. Thanks for joining us, Tom. You bet. All right, we're back live now and joined by James Causey, our editorial page columnist here at the Journal Sentinel. And we want to shift the focus now to the overall debate rather than just how Scott Walker did. So I'm gonna, I was going to ask everyone to give me their, their own Secret Service code name, but I'm going to give you an easier one. Just tell me your winners and losers from the uh, debate last night. Okay, um, my winner from last night is Ben Carson. Um, I think he's a winner because everybody focused their attention on Trump. And it's going to allow him to rise up the polls a little bit more. Um, loser is hard to pick one, but I'm going to go with two. Uh, I'm going to say Scott Walker because I don't think he did enough to separate himself from the rest of the pack. And I'm also going to go with Jeb Bush simply because I, I just don't think he did enough last night, and especially when he talked about how he was upset and he wanted Trump to apologize to his Mexican-American wife. And Trump said, no, I'm not really going to apologize. And he just bagged down. It, it made him look weak, and it made it look like he really wasn't that upset. So All right. those are my two. Winners and losers, Mary. Um, so for winners, I'm going to say Carly. I think she did well. I think she showed that she should be in the prime time debate and not at the kids' table debate. Um, she's gotten a lot of mileage from the Trump insult and really seems to be coming into her own and seems very comfortable and very able to uh, speak off the cuff. And uh, she didn't come off as stiff or rehearsed or politician-y um, for losers or loser. Can I just say the undercard table? I just felt like those guys, you got to start wondering, like, at what point are they going to just start dropping out of the race? All right. And Craig, what's your, uh, give us a winner and a loser from your vantage point. Well, I'm going to give you more than one, too. And this is not, oh, come I'm on, not going to. <laughs> winner, loser. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not undercard. I'm I'm the what's going on here? <laughs> I'm not going to grade them on what I thought they should have done, but whether how I just, just how I think they performed, it came across. And I think Fiorina and Rubio had good debates. I think if you're an anti-interventionist Republican, and I, maybe there's not too many out there, I think Rand Paul got his message across about um, not getting into Middle Eastern wars. But on the loser side, I thought that um, Carson, Trump, and Bush had weak performances. I didn't think they were very commanding. I thought they showed some vulnerabilities and some chinks. All right, let's, let's break this down it, kind of by groups out there, because there's sort of the insurgent outsider candidates, and there's actually the way they lined up on stage with most of the governors on one side and the U.S. senators on the others. But talk about the outsiders. So Trump, uh, Fiorina, Ben Carson, I guess I'll just throw in Mike Huckabee there because he's not really running on his record as Arkansas governor, but who, how did those guys fare in, in relation to each other? Craig, what was your, your sense on well, that? Well, what was interesting to me about it was you had, you had all this skirmishing between two outsiders, I mean, Fiorina and Trump. I mean, they're both kind of presumably going after some of the same voters, voters that are turned off by all the politicians in the race, and this is the first time we had that dynamic where we had major outsiders really going at it with each other. So, um, and I thought Fiorina got the better of that exchange, but I thought it was a really interesting new dynamic in the race. Yeah, well, I thought too. There was a, an interesting exchange between you know Ben Carson and Donald Trump on the on the vaccination question. So you've got a pediatrician, a, a neurosurgeon, pediatrician, pediatrician, but that background on there, he didn't you know call out Donald Trump really on the science of it. Kind of just let it lie there a little bit. Yeah, he did. And, and you know, and this is a, a, a guy who really knows his stuff, but he didn't call him out. And so that made me wonder, could this be like a, a ticket party? Could it be Trump and Carson as vice president? I mean, I don't know. Okay, Trump, Carson, do you ever see those guys lining up, Mary? Uh, you know, at this point, I don't really know what to expect. I was a little caught off guard by the vaccination question. I'm assuming we're going to see another 
wave of anti-vaccination movements after Trump's comments. Um, and I did feel like Trump, I, I feel like Carson was trying to be respectful and trying to not, you know, mix it up with him and um, was trying to basically say there's no proof that vaccinations cause autism. But yeah, he didn't really like get into it with them. Yeah, well, let's talk briefly now about kind of the, the governor's group, which was on to the right when you were watching this screen. You had, you have Jeb Bush, you know, Scott Walker, uh, John Kasich, and, and Chris Christie. Who, who among that group stuck out for you, Craig? Well, I mean, Chris Christie kind of clawed his way to the front of the stage for a while there, more than most people expected. I think he's been a forgotten figure to some degree in this race. So. I think in that sense, it was a good debate for him. Um, I think um, within the governors, I think you had some interesting uh, fault lines between Jeb Bush and Scott Walker. I mean, you had Jeb Bush criticizing Scott Walker on foreign policy over this notion that we should rescind the invitation to a state dinner to the leader of China and this idea of tearing up the Iran nuclear agreement on day one. And Jeb Bush was kind of poo-pooing both those ideas as being kind of naive. Yeah. James, what's your take among the, the governors there? That, I mean, Chris Christie, I mean, he's, he's seemed to jump out frequently to, to say things like, you know, quit the bickering, yeah. you know, quit yeah. that, get back to the middle class. Is that a, a way to draw yeah. attention? I, I think he did a good job at doing that when he said, uh, when he mentioned to Trump, well, you guys are rich, you guys have money, and you're, you're, you're a great business person, but this isn't about you guys. This is about the middle class. This is about people we have to find jobs for. Did a great job on that point. Yeah, well, of the governors, I mean, uh, Scott Walker is when he seemed to me, anyways, to do a little better. John Kasich seemed to not do as well. I in thought my he didn't do as. Way. Yeah, I thought so. I thought Walker did better. Um, I thought Kasich didn't do as well. I thought I actually thought that Bush did better in this debate in that he came off as a little higher energy and um, a little bit more relaxed and kind of poking fun at himself occasionally. Um, than the first debate, which I thought he just did poorly. Well, his hashtag name was Energizer, right? Right. His yes, yeah. his code name was Energizer, well, and then might, he and Trump kind of like hand slapped. Right. Um, so then let's the U.S. Ever ready. Ever, ever ready. ready. ever ready. Ever ready. That's what it was. There you go. Uh, at the other end of the stage, we had the the, the three U.S. senators there. Uh, Rand Paul, who got a kind of a gratuitous shot early on from Donald Trump of, by the way, he shouldn't be here, and he doesn't <laughs> look good either. I haven't made fun of his looks, even though there's plenty. But then of Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Craig, did either of that group, who, who stood out for you? Well, I think, you know, Rubio is a good debater. I think he comes across um, as, as uh, smooth and poised and knowledgeable. So I think he, he makes a good impression in that sense. I think there's an interesting just policy split between these guys, especially on foreign policy with Rubio and, and, and Rand Paul at just kind of polar opposite ends. And... And Rand Paul had a fair amount of speaking time in this debate for another guy who's been kind of a forgotten figure um, and may not be going anywhere, but he had a lot of time to kind of articulate, to make his case against, um, you know, uh, military adventurism and intervention in the Middle East in a way that really no other Republicans are making. Let me ask, you know, James and Mary among that group as well. So did anyone stand out between, you know, Paul Rubio and Ted Cruz? Uh, to me, uh, they, they sort of talked over each other. I, I don't know. They, I don't think they either did enough to, to rise to the top either, so I was a little disappointed in it. Um, you, Mary? Yeah, I think that Rubio, he comes off, he comes across as very um, prepared, very earnest, maybe sometimes like over prepared, like he's got his lines ready that he's, you know, maybe like a little stiff. But I don't think any of them had a light, uh, line that was as memorable as like the I don't know, the Walker-Trump exchange or when mm -hmm. Trump telling Jeb that he doesn't feel safer after his brother's presidency. Right. I feel like we're going to hear that line All repeated. Right. Well, let's ask everybody here, just in the, when we were here after the first debate, there's sort of that immediate assessment and then there's what settles in to become more the conventional wisdom. So, Craig, what will we be talking about in a week? What do you think the conventional wisdom will be out of this debate? Well, since the conventional wisdom is almost entirely poll-driven, I think it's going to depend on what the next few polls show. And it's going to be interesting if Carly Fiorina gets a bump out of this debate, it's going to come from somewhere. And, and does it come from Ben Carson? Does it come from Donald Trump, who are the two other so-called outside candidates? Um, if it does come from one of those two, then that gives uh, the, the contest, it changes the landscape of this race in the short run. I don't know that we're going to see dramatic movement among the kind of more established candidates. 
All right, let's let's turn now to some viewer questions, and really they're viewer comments that we've I've pulled from some of our, our articles and Facebook pages, see what the assessment of some of our readers and folks was. And this one I'm going to direct the, for a comment to Mary. It's, it's from Marco61 who says, Christy Kasich and Fiorina helped themselves the most last night. Walker, Paul, and Huckabee should just drop out. They have as much chance to win the GOP nomination as the Brewers do to win the World Series <laughs> zero. Ouch. So let me ask it this way. Do you, who do you think, I mean, we, Rick Perry was dropped out in the last week mm -hmm. or so. Who, who do you think may be next or most at risk of not, not staying in the race? Um, I don't know. I gotta think somebody like um, George Pataki, who um, you know is clearly a very experienced man, but is does not. I mean, what is he pulling at? Like zero? Like at what? How? At what point do you right. just? Yeah, I think what people if, if you just a, watch the the main debate, there's the four from the you know Jindal and Pataki and, mm -hmm. and, and Graham and some of the others who are pulling even worse. So that maybe they're the ones who'll be first out. I would think Craig, so. Craig, let me ask you to respond to this one. And this was a comment from from Who Moved My Cheese. It says, looking forward to Walker being demoted to the kitty table at the next debate. Do you th see a danger that he would be relegated to that in the October uh, forum? I, I'd be surprised. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, it's gonna depend on, and I haven't looked at this, but it's gonna depend on the timetable they use for the polling. And so the only way he's gonna fall out is if the the most recent polls show him at one or two percent, and they and they're they're not going back, you know, two or three or four or five weeks when his polling was better. Um, so it's not an impossibility, but I'd be surprised if it happened. Yeah, I wonder. Even looking ahead beyond that, there's the November debate here in Milwaukee, and that would be the sort of the biggest embarrassment for him if he couldn't make the stage in the debate here in the in Wisconsin. That would hurt. Uh, let me direct this one to James. This is a comment from Garrus Braveheart. I'm not sure if he's like from Game of Thrones or something, but uh, it says, I, I can't wait for more debates with fewer candidates. These first two debates were all about forcing complex and ideas and plans into 30 second sound bites. We would all learn a lot more if there are only three to four people on stage and given much more time to talk. What I agree. I don't, I don't really care much for the format the way it's set up. Um, you have to almost um, interject yourself to really get time. I, and plus, this last debate, it was designed to me, in my opinion, to jump Trump. And um, it was designed for them to argue amongst themselves and not really get much across other than a soundbite, so. Yeah. Now, Craig, you've watched a lot of these debates over time. I was asked you to compare the, the first one on Fox to this one. It, it, was there any, it seemed to me like the Fox one, there was a, there were a, the moderators were a little more controlled in terms of the situation, and this one got maybe a little, in well, you know, it hand. depends on what you want, what you like in your debates. I mean, the Fox one, they had, there was a lot of aggressive and very well-prepared questioning of the candidates. So the dynamic was really between the panel and the candidates. And this one, the panel uh, was just trying to get the candidates to engage with each other. That's the way they constructed the questions. And beyond that, they were clearly trying to get certain candidates to engage with each other. So they were less concerned than the Fox panel with spreading the time around, and they were much more concerned with um, kind of, uh, fueling the skirmishes between Trump and some of his rivals. And, you know, I think they were both entertaining debates and interesting debates. We learned a lot. They obviously are impacting the race. Um, you can err in both directions. You can err, having participated in a debate back in 2004 that we did in Wisconsin, you know, you discover with the, for the way you set up the format and structure of these debates, you can err either on the side of a stiff debate where there's no interchange between the candidates or all the way over to the other end of the spectrum where you get a complete food fight. And I think both these debates have been something in between, which is good. All right. Do well, I think we're going to leave it there for this week's uh, program? We'll be back next week at this time, and I'm going to require everyone to come with their own Secret Service code name. Oh, so go. that's fair warning for. It won't know, be three hours, it, will it? It won't be three hours. It'll be 30 minutes. So we'll see everybody <laughs> next week. Thank you.